Hey, y'all. It's Amy Willis. I am staff attorney at Legal Aid Services of Oregon, coming live here from Don't Shoot PDX's Liberated Archives, a really cool space up here at Souvenir Arts um, in the Alberta Art District, some historical remnants of redlining and racist housing um, policies. So I think that's a great segue for us to be talking about today, which is tenants' rights. So we're going to be covering, covering some very basic stuff about evictions, um, including what will happen if you go to court. And um, of course, we're also going to be providing you some links to all this information, which will be on the web. All right, so let's get started. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So, like I said, I'm a staff attorney at Legal Aid Services of Oregon, also called LASSO. We're a nonprofit, and what that means is that our legal assistance, our legal advice, and legal representation is all free. So, if you qualify for our services, you don't have to pay anything. So, um, I'm in the Portland office, so we're mostly serving um, Multnomah County and Clackamas County. Um, we do also technically cover Hood River, Sherman, and Waspo counties. Um, and so, like I said, I do, I'm here covering housing law, so I do practice housing law, um, but our office also covers some other areas, family law, including um, DV, domestic violence issues, um, senior law, um, government benefits, consumer law, so we, employment discrimination, um, and wage stuff. So we do cover some other issues, but right now we're just gonna be talking about housing. All right, so like I said, we're just gonna do an overview today about eviction basics, and it's going to include um, stuff about HB 2001, which was just passed um, a couple of months ago. So that's some good news for tenants. And then we're gonna go over um, what could happen at a first appearance, which is when you literally first go to court. Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Gomez. I'm a legal clerk at Legal Aid Services of Oregon. So uh, I'm just going to go briefly over what the eviction notice process is and how a tenant gets served with a termination notice. So the very first thing we ha I have to explain is that there is a difference between a termination notice and an eviction notice. A termination notice is Essentially, the landlord telling the tenant, hey, you have to stop whatever action it is you're doing, such as non-payment of your rent, being a disturbance or destruction of property. And at that point, if the tenant fails to correct any or cure any of their actions, the landlord then moves into the eviction case. So termination notice does, that, does not mean that the tenant is automatically being evicted. That's where the eviction notice comes in and the case comes in. At that point, there are multiple ways that a landlord and tenant can deal with an eviction case, such as in the termination notice, tenant gets the notice, they either can settle, as such as they cure the deficiency and they stay, or the tenant moves out. And again, the tenant can actually continue the fight and take it to court. For the eviction case, same rules apply, both parties can cure and settle and both parties stay in the re relevant position or the tenant moves out. Another case would be that this eviction case is filed, the tenant is served, and at that point, both parties say, hey, we are going to go and dispute this case in the court in front of a judge. So moving on to step three, that is the first appearance, which is very critical for both parties to appear because if one party 
does not appear for the first appearance, they default. Basically, they, they lose. They never show up to argue their case. So that's why it is such an important thing to not miss the first appearance. As a tenant, you want to show up. You want to show up in a business attire, professional attire, and you want to have your argument well thought out as, a, as a, you rehearse what you're going to tell the judge. That way you can clearly articulate why you're in court. So now at that point, you appear, you ask for a trial, you move on to step four in which both parties, they file what their side of the argument is pretty much. And then we go up to uh, stage five, which is the actual trial. Now, the new portion is that that is the last chance to redeem the tenancy in non-payment cases, meaning that the tenant can pay off their tenancy costs up until the point that they go into trial. If non-payment is the reason why the termination notice and the eviction case was filed. Now, during the trial, there are two main outcomes because the tenant can either stay, argue, and then if they win the case, they remain at the residence. If the landlord wins the case and the judge rules for the judge or the jury rules for the landlord, the tenant will be given four days to move out of that of their residency. If the tenant fails to move out in those four days at that point, the landlord themselves, the landlord cannot actually evict you, but they will coordinate with the sheriff's department or the police department to evict you out. Now over here are the four major termination notices types. So we'll start off with the no cost one. Now, the no cost is basically the, the landlord saying, I don't, don't need a reason to cancel our agreement. Now, this, let's say this coordination usually comes when a, a tenant is, is paying a month by month um, rent lease. And they, at any point, the landlord can say, yeah, I'm just gonna forfeit, like you don't pay for next month, you're, I want a new tenant. There is one exception, however, and that is that if the tenant has lived in that current home for more than one year, the landlord cannot exercise this no cost. The next one I wanna focus on is the four cost piece, which is, it is when the landlord uses his termination notice because the tenant violated their rental agreement in, an, in any way or the tenant violates the law. For example, that tenant can be destructive of the property. They can be a disturbance. The landlord and the tenant, you know, they have a contract. So if in that contract it states, for example, no pets allowed, and the tenant brings a pet without proper, let's say, documentation or med uh, medical paperwork, or it's not a, a, a pet that needs to be present, the landlord can use that for costs. And they must confront the tenant that way they get the termination notice and in the termination notice, the landlord will say, hey, you have, let's say a week, 14 days, whichever the case, to cure this, which in that case would be getting rid of, of the pet. The next portion I want to talk about is the non-payment, which is a sub category of four costs, which is pretty much saying that the landlord is about to terminate the tenant's lease because the tenant has failed to provide monetary compensation, fails to pay the rent. Now, there are ways in which the landlord and the tenant can both meet at the middle and discuss a payment plan forward. That way the tenant says, hey, I know I'm behind in my, in my monthly rent. However, I can increase future payments that way I can compensate for the last loss in, in rent. And the last one is the landlord-based reason. So now landlords are permitted to evict you for reasons that do not concern the tenant whatsoever. One of the chief examples of this is that the landlord, <clears throat> to the, the landlord sells the property to another landlord. And that new landlord says, hey, I'm gonna use this property for, for my own benefit, my own uh, personal residency. Another reason is the landlord says, hey, guess what? I actually wanna move into the, into the residency that the tenant is in. At that point, the landlord can evict them. Tenant has done nothing wrong. 
there's really nothing that tenant can do at that point except look for uh, residency elsewhere. Now, the tenant can request the landlord to help them find, secure a new place, offset some cost fees, but it really is situationally dependent. And here are the only ways in which the termination notice must be given. So the first one is the personal delivery in which the landlord or whatever agent from the landlord, they actually hand the tenant the termination notice. The next one is a first class mail, which it adds a three days to the notice period since notices of the termination, they can have multiple timelines associated with them. So the first class, whichever, time it says that you got to cure this, this deficiency by at three days. And the last one is post and mail, which is a combination of the previous two in, in which the, ten, the tenant is made aware of the landlord's say disagreement and whatever cost the landlord is using to invoke that termination notice. And here's some, some of the notices that termination must contain. It must be like when it was issued, the vacate date. And remember the three day applies if the termination notice uh, was mailed in. Additional information for veterans, such as where they can seek out uh, resources. What is the chance to cure? Chance to cure is saying like the landlord is saying, hey, I need you to understand that this, I'm not, kicking you out that this is a done deal. It is not. That's the main difference between a termination notice and eviction notice. Chance Secure is saying, what does the landlord want the tenant to do in order to make this termination notice go away for good? And the last piece is the relocation assistance. Like for example, for the, the landlord cost, the landlord base cost in which the tenant has done nothing wrong, what assistance can the landlord and will the landlord give the tenant to assist in moving to a residency, whether that be I forgo the last month of, of rent, I assist you with moving costs, I pay for your hotel, whichever agreement the landlord gives tenants. Thanks, Kevin. And just to clarify, if you live in the city of Portland um, and you receive a certain type of termination notice, such as the landlord-based reason, or if they were to raise your rent above um, the cap, you actually do have to receive um, a letter at the time that you receive the termination notice um, stating how much relocation assistance you would be um, eligible for. And it's actually going to be based on number of bedrooms, right? So, you know, you don't really have to worry about that specific amount right now. If you were to receive this notice, it, it actually needs to tell you that information. And it, when it's done, best case scenario, they actually give you that check um, at that time. But of course, it's not usually done that way, in which case you should you know, give us a call. Okay. So let's just move on real quick. And I wanna cover some of the stuff that's done here in what we call the HB 2001, which I mentioned earlier, which is this new law that actually is supposed to um, you know, allow folks more time if they fall behind on rent for whatever reason, which, you know, the non-payment cases, right? So the old law, which used to be you had to have 72 hour notice where the landlord would say, hey, you're late, you know, you have to pay within 72 hours. That is no longer true. And now it's a 10 day notice period. So definitely a lot longer period of time. And actually, um, you know, there's some different little caveats of, about that. So like if you're in a subsized tenancy, you still actually get a 30 day notice. So, you know, that might be if you have a voucher or if you live in certain buildings that have a subsidy. And so, you you know, you don't pay um, more than say 30% of your income. So you actually get even more time then. It's still, unfortunately, only folks who might be living in what we call a week to week type situation, uh, maybe you live in, in like an extended stay or something like that, you would still be allowed to be served um, a 72 hour notice, unfortunately. Okay. 
So, hang on. All right. So I talked to you about how the notice period has been extended. Um, I also want to add that now they actually have to provide you, um, you know, a document that explicitly tells you, hey, this is an eviction for non-payment. It's going to look like something like here that's on the screen. Um, it's going to give you information such as call 211 if you need rental assistance. Also, it would even have our information to give us a call for legal assistance. So if they actually do not include this information, technically that's not proper notice. And in theory, a judge should actually dismiss that case because they failed to give you the notice that's required under the law. And so um, just real quick here, we have um, the, again, you know, Kevin mentioned this earlier, it used to be that when you received a non-payment notice, you just didn't have a lot of time to pay it, right? Now you actually have not even just the 10 day period, you have beyond that, which is up of course until the time of trial. So if you were to request a trial, which is something that you do have to do affirmatively, which means you have to say to the court, I want a trial, right? You cannot assume that they will just give you a trial date. But you would, you know, one reason to maybe do that would be because you would have additional time to uh, figure out how to get that money, whether it's from rental assistance or whether, you know, waiting on a check to come in, whatever it is, you would have more time to pay it. And, and at that point, um, like the, the landlord has to accept it. So it's not just that you have the money, the landlord has to accept it, in which case then the eviction would be dismissed, right? Okay, so moving on here, when I was talking about the eviction, so Kevin was covering all the termination notices, you know, and, and there's actually a couple different ones, but that's, we actually have a very detailed handbook on our, our website. So if you're like, I'm not sure what notice I got, don't worry about it. We'll give you that information at the end. But so let's say, unfortunately, you have received that termination notice. You're not able to, you know, maybe get the rent together if that's the issue, or maybe it's a landlord-based reason. Um, and they're telling you you have to move out, even though it's completely unfair because they want to move in their cousin or whatever, right? But um, if you're not able to move out by the time that termination notice expires, that is when the landlord is now allowed to go to the court and file what Oregon calls the forcible entry and detainer, which is a very, I mean, horrible expression, but or FED, but it's really just as, it's an eviction. All right. And so evictions are made to go very fast. You know, unlike other types of court cases that could go on for years, evictions are meant to happen within a month. I mean, of course, you know, that's going to be dependent on how busy the court is. So like I said, after the termination notice has expired, then really the next day after that expiration date, the landlord can go to the court and they can file the official eviction. And then the court will send you know you a notice, you'll receive a notice saying, hey, you got to come. You, you know, someone's basically filed a lawsuit against you, even though we're talking about an eviction, it's, it is a lawsuit. So again, timeline's really fast. You're probably going to get that within seven to 15 days. So it could be, you know, a little longer, a little less. It really depends on the, how busy the court is. You know, Portland's obviously, if you're living in Portland, it's a pretty big, busy court, but you'll get that notice. And then um, you know, that's when we get to the part about the first appearance, right? So just, you know, I know Kevin already mentioned this, but if you do not show up, the landlord automatically wins, right? So even if you've paid um, the rent, right, you, you should still go because the court's not going to know that you've done that, right? And honestly, you don't want to rely necessarily on the landlord just saying, oh, I'll just go and I'll just go and tell them. Right, you need to be the one to go there because the court does not know whatever agreement you've had. And the same goes for if you move out, right? Maybe you just were fed up with it or you found a new place, whatever it is. If you moved out, you might think, oh, I don't gotta go anymore. That's not true. You you, you cannot rely on the landlord necessarily conveying that's what's gonna happen to court. So you need to go, even if it's just to say, hey judge, I moved out, okay? All right, so I kind of went over some of this a little bit at the first slide, but just again, like I said, if you default, 
that's technically when you just um you don't you just don't show up. And it could be because hey, you were sick, you were in the hospital, you the bus was late, you know, um maybe you physically are unable to make it there, um or you um you know you need an assistance with language that you know you're not able to get an interpreter in time. I mean those are potentially maybe the only times when a court would say, hey, you had a good reason for not showing up and maybe they would, you know, basically reopen the case. But if it's not one of those reasons and you just don't show up, I mean, unfortunately the landlord has won the case at that point, okay? So it's again, very, very important just to go ahead and show up, even if you're just going, like I said, to say, oh yeah, I paid the rent. Oh yeah, I moved out or, we made an agreement, you should still go ahead and show up. So after this happens, let's say you go and um, you go to court and maybe you're not able to make an agreement at that time, or you know you have um, issues you wanna bring up, right? Um, like bad conditions, or maybe the landlord made in a mistake with how much money they're claiming that you owe and y'all cannot come to agreement. At that time, you could ask for a trial, okay? Because the first appearance is not a trial. The judge is not gonna get into all these details that first time. You have to ask for a trial. And then you just do that the same day. You can go to the clerks. You can say, I need the, I need the form to ask for a trial. It's technically called the answer form. But you get that form, you fill it out, and then they're scheduled the trial. Usually, again, because these cases are really fast, you're gonna get it in about a week or so. So one thing just to keep in mind, okay, about these these trials is that these are what's called a bench trial, okay? So that means there is no jury. It's just going to be the judge, yourself, and the landlord. Well, and if there's attorneys, but that's the only people who are going to be involved in this type of case. And the other really, really, really important thing to remember about a trial is that if you lose, whether it's you or the landlord, you actually might actually have to pay for the attorney's fees or court costs. So a court cost might be the fee the landlord paid to actually file the eviction against you, which seems of course unfair that you would have to pay for the landlord you know, filing the eviction against you, but that's a an example of a court cost, okay? And again, like I said, if you've already moved out um, or the landlord has accepted the rent because you, know, you were able to get that situation worked out, um, or maybe they should have never even filed the case to begin with and they recognize, yeah, we messed up. Um, that's at at this time, the court can go ahead and dismiss it. And that's, again, another reason why you should show up, because if you tell the judge, you know, this is what's happened um, and, and the landlord's like, yeah, that's what happened. We all agree. Then the judge will go ahead and dismiss your whole case. OK. Okay, so just real quick, you know, because the landlord is the one bringing the case against you, they actually have to prove that they can do that, which might mean, um, hey, the termination they gave you is correct, right? Not only is the termination correct, they have to prove they gave it to you correctly, right? We talked about that earlier. Did they mail it to you and not remember to add on the three extra days? Because if they did not do that, that is incorrect service. And technically they have to do that, right? Add on those days if they mail it, mail the termination notice to you. So um, again, if it's, um, they're claiming, you know, you had unauthorized guest, you know, unauthorized pet or whatever it is, they actually have to prove that's something that happened and not, you know, just what they think happened, right? So they do have to prove these things. Um, so yeah, if they don't do that, then, you know, they, uh, could get the case actually dismissed against them. And in terms of yourself, you know, you're in this, at this point, mostly defending. Okay. Um, now you could also do something called a counterclaim and that would be, you know, um, typically is usually because of bad conditions, right? Bad, um, issues going on in the home. So, you know, even if the landlord's saying you have X, Y, Z things, you know, or you haven't paid your rent, you could say, okay, you know, but I'm also going to bring a counterclaim, which is like, you didn't repair, um, you know, the AC unit and it was the summertime and it was too hot, you know, that could be a counterclaim. Um, so the judge could hear both of these, both of these things. Okay. Okay. So of course the outcome, honestly, there is 
mostly just two outcomes, which is you win or you lose, right? So unfortunately, if the landlord wins, the time at which you would have to move out, absent some other agreement between you and the landlord, is four days, very short amount of time. So the judge is not going to actually be able to give you more time than that. So the only person who could agree to something different would be the landlord, but the judge can't say, you know, oh, I really feel for you. I'm going to give you five days. Okay. The law says, you know, it has to, you know, or, or I, I can give you, the landlord says, I really want them out now. You know, I want them out tomorrow. The judge can say, no, actually they have to have at least four days. So kind of both, it works both ways on that, right? Um, unfortunately, if they win and they have an attorney, you could be stuck having to pay some attorney's fees. Could be, you know, in this case, hopefully it has not been a long trial. So it could be a couple hundred, to even a couple thousand dollars. So it could be expensive if it goes on for a long time. If you win, um, what will happen is typically... Um, they might just dismiss the whole case um, and no fees or anything like that. So um, that's better for you, I guess. And then if you do go to court and you have an attorney, they might then at that point enter in the um, the fees part, part so that your attorney can get paid by the landlord. Okay. And again, this is something honestly that is really common for um, Multnomah County, which is that stipulated agreements, which basically are just, you know, it's just like you've mediated and you you both agreed on a new contract essentially, right? So this could be as simple as when are you going to move out if that's what you want to do? Or it could be a payment plan, right? Or it could be even saying something that's like, I won't make loud noises during quiet hours. If that's what you're allegedly doing, you can write that in this stipulated agreement. So it doesn't have to be just about money and it doesn't have to be just about moving out. It could be about all sorts of things. Whatever it is, it cannot be something that, you know, would essentially replace your lease, right? And that's why it cannot be longer than six months, okay? So as long as you are complying with this agreement, you know, you're following it. If you're, you're doing what you said that you're going to do, then the case will be dismissed. Now, unfortunately, if you do not follow it and not because you don't want to, but just something happens, right? And so a lot of times this happens typically in payment plans. So if you made a payment plan and you agreed to pay on the fifth of every month or whatever it is, and you paid on the sixth, technically you have not followed the plan and the landlord could um, actually, you know, say to the court, hey, they broke the agreement, okay? Um, and then, you know, technically they can do that without actually having to go, having everyone go back to court. They actually just would file a piece of paper. But you, you know, you know, I see this happen, especially with non-payments, you know, checks getting delayed and all that, is you do actually have an opportunity to request a hearing, you know, when the landlord is saying, oh, you didn't comply, um, you have an ability to, you know, say, hey, you know, to the court, uh, that's actually not true, you know, and so you could you could do that, request that hearing. Um, again, if you do not make this kind of agreement, you know, then you have to go to trial, which we talked about, you know, the pros and cons of that. But again, just stressing here, there's a little bit of a legalese when it says strict performance, that really just means you have to follow it exactly. So don't agree to a payment plan or don't agree to like, you know, whatever it is, if you don't think you can actually do it, unfortunately, because that just makes it really easy for the landlord to go ahead and evict you. And again, just um, just some other things that could happen that you, you know, if you do have to go to a non-compliance hearing, you know, um, one thing that also happened was the landlord didn't comply. You know, I didn't mention that earlier, but part of the agreement can also include um, something the landlord should be doing, which might be fixing and doing repairs, right? Or whatever it is. So both sides actually have to agree um, to, to do whatever it is in the agreement. It's not just like it, you're the only one who has to do something if that's like the kind of situation um, that's going on, okay? So if you win the non-compliance hearing, the good news is you cannot, you cannot be evicted. Okay, so let's say unfortunately you have um, lost lost your case. Okay, 
And um, at this point, the court will issue something called the notice of restitution. Um, and this basically is the notice saying you have to move out. It's legalese word, but basically means you have to move out. You know, again, it's the four days thing. Um, and then, you know, if you don't move out during this time period, unfortunately, the worst case scenario is now the landlord can go to the court and get something called the writ of execution, which again, sounds very scary. But basically, this is what you see, you know, on TV and movies when the, the sheriff has come into your home and they can open the lock and take take you out of the house with your stuff. So that is the writ of execution and that's absolutely the final step if you were to not move out before then, okay? And the landlord cannot do this just on their own. So it would actually be illegal for them to lock you out if they do not have the sheriff present. So they cannot just say, oh, I have the writ and I'm just gonna change the locks and throw all your stuff out. They, that would actually be illegal. Okay, so just real quick again about the fees. Um, if you win, you know, maybe you could actually even reduce the fees that they allegedly have to owe you um, to re reduce rent, for example. And then unfortunately, if the landlord wins, it can be quite negative um, because if you're not able to pay it, right, they could send it to collections, um, they could add it to payment plans, um, and it is a money judgment, so it could potentially show up I mean, not potentially, it would show up eventually on your credit report if someone's doing a credit check on you, okay? And then again, um, after you go to court, you there are a couple situations in which you can actually have your whole eviction um, hidden from records and that's called expungement. So, um, you know, one of the new things that has happened is that because of COVID and so many people were receiving evictions, um, now, basically, this is going to be available between for the peak COVID times, if you will, from April 1st, 2020 to February 28th, 2022. Um, as long as you don't owe any money, owe any money they're basically going to do these um, expungements for you. OK, um, so we also do run an expungement clinic a pro bono. So it's free. So, you know, you can always contact us if you need assistance getting it. It is mostly just a form that you you fill out. But other than that, so let's say you've received an eviction that's not during the COVID times. Um, in general, if you have already won the case, right, or the case was dismissed after five years, it actually is gonna go ahead and be expunged anyways. But you probably don't wanna wait, you know. Okay, so in this slide, we have a couple of resources available to you, such as our, our Legal Aid Service of Oregon website, Oregon Renter Rights, and Oregon Law Health. <clears throat> One thing I do want to emphasize here is that just because you have a, a problem with some other condition doesn't mean that Legal Aid Services cannot help. There are multiple cases that Legal Aid Services assist in that have multiple factors, such as it could be a landlord tenant with domestic violence implications, discrimination implications. There's multiple things. Just because you have one case doesn't mean that we can help you with other cases. So please reach out to us, let us know if you need some help, as well as you have to become educated about the rights that you have, because those are gonna be the key to having a smart, intelligent conversation with your landlord. So follow the first, the first link is a great resource to know the rights you have as a tenant, what you owe your tenant and what your, well, what, what your landlord owes you as a tenant and what you owe them as a tenant. Thank you. All right, thanks y'all. That is the end of our presentation. I know it's a lot of information to digest and by no means do you have to have it memorized. Um, and then you can follow that QR code here. It's got a link as well to all of our handouts. And again, you know, you can give us a call if you unfortunately are in this situation. So once again, I just want to wrap up and say thank you to Don't Shoot PDX. We're here in their Liberated Archives and Souvenir Arts and Alberta Arts District. And it is an awesome exhibit and really hammers home 
you know, the racial disparities in housing. So I encourage you all to come see it if you haven't already. And once again, thank you for having us and take care.